On Sept 13, 2018, in Massachusetts Merrimack Valley, a pipeline team diligently replaced an old cast iron gas line with a modern polyethylene pipe near Boston's northern region. The original cast iron system was installed in the early 1900s and due for replacement to maintain service during the project. By 4 p.m., the team had set up a bypass to supply natural gas to the downstream pipe during its disconnection and connection to the new plastic main line. The new polyethylene main had been connected and the old cast iron pipe capped official. The last step of the job was to abandon the cast iron line. Both valves on either side of the bypass were shut. The bypass line was severed, isolating the antiquated cast iron pipe from the system entirely. But it was immediately clear that something was wrong. Within minutes of closing those valves, the pressure readings on the new natural gas line spiked. One of the fittings on the new line blew off into a worker's hand, and as they were trying to plug the leak, the crew heard emergency sirens in the distance. They looked up and saw plumes of smoke rising above the horizon. By the end of the day, over 100 structures would be damaged by fire and explosion. In one of America's most devastating natural gas disasters, numerous homes would be obliterated, leaving a tragic toll. 22 people injured, including three firefighters, and one fatality. Like many parts of the world, natural gas is an important source of energy in homes and businesses in the United States. It's a fossil fuel composed mostly of methane gas extracted from geologic formations using drilled wells. The U.S. has an enormous system of natural gas pipelines that essentially interconnect the entire lower 48 states. Very generally, gathering lines connect lots of individual wells to processing plants. Transmission lines connect those plants to cities, and then the pipes spread back out again for distribution. Compressor stations and regulators maintain gas pressure as required in the system. U.S. cities distribute natural gas to customers for heating, cooking, hot water, and more, akin to the power grid but with distinct differences. Just like a grid uses different voltages to balance the efficiency of transport with the complexity of the equipment, a natural gas network uses different pressures in transmission lines. Compressor stations boost the pressure to maximize flow within the pipes. That's appropriate for individual pipelines where it's worth the cost for higher pressure readings and more frequent inspections. But it's a bad idea for the walls of homes and businesses to contain pipes full of high-pressure explosive gas. So where safety is critical, the pressure is lowered using regulators. Just a quick note on units before we get too far. There are quite a few ways we talk about system pressures in natural gas lines. Low-pressure systems often use inches or millimeters of water column as a measure of pressure. For example, a typical residential natural gas pressure is around 12 inches or 300 millimeters of water. Basically, the pressure at which you would have to blow into a vertical tube to get the water to raise that distance. About that roughly half a psi or 30 millibars. You also sometimes see pressure units with a G at the end like SIG. That G stands for gauge, and it just means that the measurement excludes atmospheric pressure. Most pressure readings you encounter in life are gauge values that ignore the pressure from Earth's atmosphere. But natural gas engineers prefer to be specific, since it can make a big difference in low-pressure systems. The natural gas main line in the Merrimack Valley being replaced had a nominal pressure of 75 PCI or about 5 bar, although that pressure could vary depending on flows in the system. Just for comparison, that's 173 feet or more than 50 meters of water column. But the distribution system, the network of underground pipes feeding individual homes and businesses needed a consistent half a PCI or 30 mil bar. No matter how many people were using the system, the device that made this possible was a regulator. There are lots of different types of regulators used in natural gas systems. But the ones in the Merrimack Valley use pilot-operated devices, which are pretty ingenious. It's basically a thermostat, 
but for pressure instead of temperature. The pilot is a small pressure regulating valve that supports the opening or closing of the larger primary valve. If the pilot senses an increase or decrease in pressure from the set point, it changes the pressure in the main valve diaphragm, causing it to open or close. This all works without any source of outside power, just using the pressure of the main gas line. Columbia Gases Winthrop Station was just a short distance south of where the high-end work was being done on the day of the event. Inside, a pair of regulators in series was used to control the pressure in the distribution system. One of these regulators, known as the worker, was the primary regulator that maintained gas pressure. A second device called the monitor added a layer of redundancy to the system. The monitor regulator was normally open with a set point a little higher than the worker, so it could kick in if the worker ever failed. And at least in theory, make sure that the low pressure system never got above its maximum operating level of about 14 inches of water column or 35 millibars. But in this worker monitor configuration, the pilots on the two regulators can't use the downstream pressure right at the main valve. Firstly, any changes in the monitor would affect the worker's reading. Secondly, measuring pressure directly at the valve can be inaccurate due to flow turbulence caused by the valve itself, similar to placing a thermostat right in front of a register, leading to an inaccurate reading. To address this, sensing lights were connected to the pilots to monitor the pressure downstream of the regulator station in the distribution system. Surprisingly, on September 13th, both the worker and monitor regulators were functioning correctly, yet they allowed high-pressure gas to enter the system, resulting in a catastrophic event. How did this happen? The NTSB report clearly states that performing a tie-in, which involves connecting a natural gas line while it's still in service, is a challenging task that requires strict procedures.